Tonight, a tragic end to a search for an Alberta family. A couple and their eight-year-old son believed to have gone through the ice. The current is very bad, and in the winter, it never froze. The warning for anyone spending time outdoors this winter. A six-year-old boy traveling alone put on the wrong flight. My stomach was tight, my heart was pounding. How an unaccompanied minor wound up in the wrong city. Searching for bargains after a year of high prices. Just going to different stores, seeing what the best deal is out there. Why some shoppers are thinking twice this Boxing Day. This is The National with Renee Filipponi. Thank you for joining us. Adrian is away. The search for an Alberta family that began on Christmas Day has ended in tragedy. Investigators say all three members of the Pelsma family have died. Their bodies found one day after the search began, later extending into a lake in rural Alberta. It's situated in Lac St. Anne, about one hour west of Edmonton. Anis Hidari now with what we know about the family and why police are warning others to exercise caution. Two days before Christmas, the Pelsma family believed to have gone off-roading together. 39-year-old Kelly, his 37-year-old wife Laura, and their 8-year-old son Dylan. The three of them riding near Lac St. Anne, but they didn't show up to an event as expected. On Christmas Day, police started searching. And on Boxing Day, underwater teams were trying to find any trace of them in the lake, later confirming the grim news. All three found dead. An area resident says this lake is dangerous. You know this place, it's, it's a red flag. You'd never go close to this place. It's pretty much every time open water. Martin Jr. Lavoie realized he knew where police would find the family. When they put the spotlight where the jerry can was, we saw the tail light and the plate flashing underwater. I know over there the current is very bad, and in winter it never froze. It's just go, go, go. Kelly Pelsma worked in the oil patch and appeared on a reality show about it. Social media posts showing his wedding earlier this year. But now a Christmas outing with a tragic ending in Lac St. Anne. A warmer than typical Alberta winter has meant that ice in some locations has been unpredictably and unexpectedly thin and dangerous. As for the Palsma family, their bodies will be taken to Edmonton for an autopsy this week. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. In Quebec, hope has faded in the search for a missing four-year-old girl. Police confirmed today their rescue mission is now a recovery mission. The girl was swept into a river while sledding north of Quebec City last Friday. And five days of searching have been futile. Yesterday, police released a photo of the clothes she was wearing in case someone had spotted them. To the Middle East now, where Israel's military operation in Gaza is expanding tonight. The war triggered by Hamas's horrific attacks on October 7th again intensifying. Israel says it's hit more than 100 targets over the past 24 hours, and civilians are running out of places to go. Israel's forces have pushed through most of the north and a part of the south, warning people to evacuate some areas there and also in central Gaza, home to tens of thousands, where now there's reports of active combat. The Hamas-run health ministry says more than 240 people were killed in the past 24 hours, 21,000 since the war began. As Tanya Fletcher shows us, the humanitarian crisis is growing. Near the border in southern Gaza, a truck arrives, delivering the bodies of roughly 80 unidentified Palestinians. Israeli forces transferring them Tuesday to authorities in Gaza for burial. It's unclear when they died or under what circumstances. We cannot open this container in a neighborhood where people live, says this doctor. The odors are unbearable. Now a mass grave is dug outside of Rafah to bury them. From the south to the north, the images that emerge are striking. Buildings that used to serve as hospitals, schools, now piles of rubble. And the war will go on for many months yet, says Israel's military chief. There are no magic solutions, no shortcuts in dismantling a terrorist organization, he said. As the fighting continues, the humanitarian toll grows more evident every day. 
cooking oil is even harder to find than food, so people have turned to burning wood. And in many parts of Gaza, it remains a daily struggle to find drinking water. The supplies that are making it into Gaza often take a long time to arrive. With two million people almost displaced, we have huge crowds living in certain areas. Even here in Rafah, sometimes it's hard to drive down the street. It takes 30 minutes to go one kilometer because there are so many people in the streets. The United Nations voiced alarm over the escalation of airstrikes over the past two days, and from Israel, a tone of defiance. An update on the deeply problematic involvement of the United Nations in this conflict. Israel accused the UN of bias against it and will now only grant visas to UN personnel on a case-by-case -case basis. It comes the same day the UN appointed a coordinator to oversee humanitarian relief shipments into Gaza, all part of Friday's resolution by the UN Security Council to boost humanitarian aid. Tanya, there is still an ongoing effort to at least limit the fighting so more aid can get in. Hey, that's right, Renee. Today, Israel's Minister of Strategic Affairs, Ron Dermer, he's considered to be a very close confidant to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He was here in Washington meeting with the U.S. Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor. And this comes after days of U.S. pressure on Israel to scale back its full-blown military assault in favor of something more targeted. But so far, no updates from the White House on the outcome of those meetings. Renee? Thanks, Tanya. That's the CBC's Tanya Fletcher in Washington. And an escalation in another war tonight as Ukraine claims it has destroyed a powerful Russian warship with a missile strike in occupied Crimea. Julia Wong looks at what that attack could mean for both sides. A massive explosion with potentially huge implications as Ukraine claims it's destroyed a key Russian warship in the Crimean port of Feodosia in a direct hit with a cruise missile overnight. Blast so intense, it blew out windows and left debris scattered across parts of the city. A huge work has been done, says a Ukrainian Air Force spokesperson. A big assault carrier was destroyed. In a video on Tuesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky offered his personal gratitude to Ukraine's military, saying excellent work against the occupiers in Crimea. For their part, Russian officials have confirmed a strike on the large landing ship, capable of transporting both troops and tanks, but insist it was only damaged. With one Russian official saying, an enemy attack was carried out, the detonation has stopped, and the fire has been localized. The loss of the ship could hamper Russia's efforts to control the Black Sea and seize more Ukrainian territory along its coast. Just as Ukraine steps up its own attacks on Russian naval forces with sea drones and other weapons. Some allies say Ukraine's aggressive tactics are having an effect, with the UK's defense secretary posting, This latest destruction of Putin's navy demonstrates that those who believe there's a stalemate in the Ukraine war are wrong. But hard fighting on land continues, with Russia now claiming control of Marienka, a town in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine denies this. But is struggling to field enough troops, with Ukraine's parliament moving to drop mobilization aid from 27 to 25. The Black Sea is critical to Ukraine's economy. It's the main route for exporting its grain. It has been able to get some out, but the corridor remains under constant threat of attack in a war showing no signs of letting up. Julia Wong, CBC News, London. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has confirmed his arrival at a Siberian prison colony today. I am your new Santa Claus, he posted on X, referring to the prison's location in the Arctic Circle. The 20 days of my transportation were pretty exhausting, but I'm still in a good mood. He also described his bleak new surroundings and told supporters, don't worry about me, I'm fine. Navalny, a longtime Putin critic, is serving 30 years on charges widely seen as politically motivated. A Florida woman is demanding answers after her six-year-old grandson was put on the wrong flight when he was traveling alone to visit her. Quabina Aduro shows us what they went through and gets expert advice on how families can prevent this. Maria Ramos had big plans for her grandson's visit, but when she got to the airport, the six-year-old was nowhere to be found. My stomach was just tight, my heart was pounding. Casper was traveling as an unaccompanied minor for the first time. I ran inside the plane, 
to the flight attendant and I asked her, where's my grandson? He was handed over to you at Philadelphia. She said, no, I had no kids with me. Casper did board a flight in Philadelphia, but it wasn't the one to Fort Myers, Florida. Instead, he ended up in Orlando. They told me, no, he's not in this flight. He missed his flight. I said, no, he could not miss his flight because I have the check-in tag. Casper's story reminds people of the holiday classic Home Alone 2, when Kevin gets on the wrong flight and ends up in New York for Christmas while his family is in Florida. When Casper landed and didn't see his grandmother, he phoned her. He said, Mom, where are you? I don't see you. I got out the plane. I said, what you mean you got out the plane? He said, yes, I'm here. I land. I'm in the airport. I said, give me an adult. He said, I don't have nobody with me. Spirit Airlines says it has issued an apology to the family and it will be conducting an internal investigation. But one travel expert says the blame isn't just on the airline. I would hold the parent or guardian who boarded the child at least partially responsible because they should have gone to the gate and seen at the gate where the flight was going. As the airline industry deals with a staffing shortage, he says accidents like this may present themselves again. We have some uh, teething issues, shall we say, where the industry is growing and the business is growing faster than the staff is able to accommodate them. Although Ramos is reunited with her grandson, she's still waiting for Spirit Airlines to explain what exactly happened. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal. After another year of high inflation forced many Canadians to put big purchases on hold, Boxing Day is bringing many shoppers back out. But as Ithil Musa shows us, that retail rush may not last. Hello. At this electronic store in Calgary, shoppers are looking for a Boxing Day deal. Tyler Ferentz is pretty happy with his score. 300 bucks. That's a great deal for that. Ferentz says he's taking advantage of the lower holiday prices to make several major purchases. Getting the TV, the blender, you know, trying to get the full package, set up the kitchen and the living room. Higher prices and tighter budgets this year have many Canadians thinking twice about their spending, cutting back where they can and saving as much money as possible. We've seen interest levels, interest rates at levels we haven't seen in quite some time. Inflation, even though it's down, it's still up overall. Uh, so I think a lot of Canadians are looking to cut back on their spending. According to Statistics Canada, retail sales inched up in September and October, but early data suggests they stalled in November. The price of living has gone up by so much, so I think like having better deals would be a lot like more beneficial for everybody. Some Canadians have waited all year for prices to drop to make big purchases to find the best savings. Just doing some research, going to different stores, seeing what the best deal is out there. We're already seeing a lot of layoffs in different industries throughout Canada. So that's just making people want to save some money in case something happens to their employment situation. Choices in the face of economic uncertainty, many Canadians will likely stay frugal heading into the new year. Idil Moose, CBC News, Toronto. As many Canadians struggle to find affordable housing, critics now say the government's year-old ban on foreign buyers has done nothing to help and that it's time Canada looked outward for solutions to the housing crisis. Yvette Brent explains. A year of house hunting for this couple is ending in frustration. Outrageously priced that you asked about the foreign buyers tax and I don't think that's making an iota of difference. <laughs> All government levels have been trying to cool real estate prices. So far, Wallace sees no building she can afford. All massive buildings that are going to, what, sit empty? I doubt it. They're going to sell to foreign investors who can afford to pay the tax. Speculation taxes were introduced and expanded in B.C. and Ontario over the past five years. In January, they took it one step further with a foreign buyer's ban to try to rein in prices. Forcing Realtors say all this did little to drop prices. For the majority of home buyers, the foreign buyer's tax didn't do much. The ban aimed at non-Canadians only affected about 2% of buyers. There are so many exemptions uh, to the foreign buyer ban. It really didn't make any difference at all. CBC reached out to housing ministers at every level. All refused to comment or to explain how the ban made this housing more affordable. 
Housing experts say Canada needs to look to places where housing has been made affordable, like Singapore. Singapore has strict bans on speculation buying and much higher taxes that pay for a whole lot of public housing. The big exception is Singapore. They want to control the investor play in the housing market uh, so that there is um, opportunity for local buyers uh, to uh, be successful. This economist also sees hope in Canadian housing policy shifts around density. Having basically one story average uh, on a square foot of land when land is as precious as in Vancouver makes no sense. Governments are starting to see that. This used to be uh, in close. A bit of hope, but no quick fix. Which is frustrating for buyers waiting for the price to come down to something, you know, semi-realistic. So this couple's house hunt continues. Yvette Brent, CBC News, Vancouver. Canada's push for a third straight World Junior Hockey Championship started strong today with a big win over Finland in the opening game. Plays it back for Lambert with a shot. Rebound score! It got through Coco. Canada scored late in the first period and then four more times over the course of the game. The final score, Canada 5, Finland 2. Canada plays Latvia on Wednesday. Turning back to the conflict in the Middle East, Qatar has been a key player in getting hostages released from Gaza, but it's also home to the Hamas leadership. They are harboring the bin Ladens of this story. Why Qatar's role raises many questions, and later. The extreme regime of a California millionaire determined to stay young. I would take these roughly 64 pills. That's for just for the morning. That's just the morning. The trailblazers hunting for the fountain of youth. But next. Eight thousand someone going hungry, so I'll do my little bit. Paying it forward. In this Nova Scotia town, the restaurants serve a big helping of kindness. We're back in two. Universities across Canada are changing their cafeteria menus in an effort to provide more vegetarian options. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson now with Why Going Plant-Based has become a priority. At Canada's universities, new knowledge is no longer just the domain of students. Chefs at campus cafeterias are learning to cook up a variety of plant-based meals. At the University of British Columbia dining halls, they have reached their goal of hitting 55% of the menu with hopes to surpass that and hit 80%. UBC is a place of learning, so what a better place uh, for us to be able to play in this field and educate our, our students and our guests about the importance of, of eating plant-based. One impetus for the move is scientific reporting that animal farming is a major contributor to climate change. Anything that does encourage a shift towards plant-based foods, such as making them more accessible in universities or educating about the benefits of plant-based foods, those are all things that can help shift us towards that low animal consumption pathway. But student demand is another driver. That's in part why Western University plans to start the new year with plant-based meals comprising 40% of residents' menus. This generation coming through, they expect us to be good custodians uh, in terms of the planet and climate change and what's our responsibility. Western is retraining chefs at seven residence dining halls to make those meals tasty and nutritionally balanced. This executive chef says today's students know what they like and are unafraid to let them know what they think. We, we, we present things to the students and if the uptake's not there or... Something they don't like? We, we, that's a quick, uh, we, we quickly realize that and we'll, and we'll reel that one in and, and try something new. Universities know there may be hiccups along the way. With produce going up in price, they'll be keeping an eye on meal plan costs. But for this student, the residence canteen is getting top marks. I think overall the quality is great. It's nice, it's home cooked. Uh, it, it definitely feels like it's like warm, fresh. So it's a plant-based recipe. Uh, Small steps as places of higher learning try to reduce their carbon footprint. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, London, Ontario. A town in Nova Scotia is rallying together and prepaying for meals at restaurants for people who really need them. But as Kayla Hounsel shows us, that kindness also comes with calls for action. It is a moment that comes with no questions asked. A patron plucks a receipt from a board at the entrance to the King's Arms in Nova Scotia's Annapolis Valley. 
the meal has already been paid for by another customer. Tiffany King is staying at a local shelter. It's just with the housing crisis. She says being able to come here to get a free meal is a big help. It's good for the homeless people that can't make food. Each one of us alone can't solve the problem. Mark Rogers came up with the Pay It Forward Meal program. All I did was propose this idea. It's the patrons that come to these places that make this happen, and, and the establishments themselves that have agreed to go along with it. Nearly every restaurant in Kentville is now participating, with receipts dotting storefronts all over town. How do you say no to something like that? You don't. This restaurant owner says he's handed out hundreds of free meals in the six weeks the program has been in place. I was standing here selling a, uh, a gift card to somebody the other day, and, and they just turned, said, oh yeah, you guys are doing that Pay It Forward program, yeah. Well, here, I'd like to buy five meals, please. It's also popular at this diner. They're all meals there now, aren't they? Yes. This man is buying a ground beef dinner for someone else. We all see the homeless and everything. Hate thousand someone going hungry, so I'll do my little bit. Staff here say the need seems to be greater than ever. I'm just glad that we can do our part. And people just seem to want to participate here. Like it's been very easy to do. Back at the King's Arms, Tiffany King gets her chicken club. Have a great day. All involved say it's a Band-Aid solution, but they plan to keep doing it as long as is necessary. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Kentville, Nova Scotia. A Manitoba First Nation has reclaimed an integral part of its history. It really is symbolic that the bison are back on our land. What's more, the animals bring much needed biodiversity with them and later. The tiny Gulf state Hamas leaders call home. Qatar's controversial and key role in the Middle East. Plus, sauntered his way around until he got to the gummy bear. A bear with some very discerning tastes is one of our favorite moments of the year. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world next. A Manitoba First Nation is reintroducing bison to their land. The animals have historic ties to the region, once playing a pivotal role in the conservation of the prairies. And as Karen Paul shows us, local leaders hope that history will once again become a reality. There we go. Good job. A ceremony honoring an animal with deep spiritual significance. <laughs> Anthony Tachin's family is keeper of this herd. These animals have uh, saved our lives. They provided food and uh, we weapons out of the bones, tools, the hides for clothing, the teepees. It did everything for us. So going forward, we decided, you know what, uh, it's our turn to look after them. This territory, from the Canadian prairies to Mexico, used to have tens of millions of bison. After colonial settlements, the bison were um, eliminated, slaughtered off this continent. Gila Shimon says that coincided with government assimilation policies for Indigenous peoples, and it had consequences for grasslands and the prairies. Replaced by farmers' fields, they are now considered at-risk ecosystems. The native grasses are gone, the microbes that are so essential for, for everything that's living within those soils is gone. And that's where the bison helped, grazing, then relieving themselves, reintroducing nutrients and spreading seeds, rolling in the ground, creating wallows where rainwater can gather, ecosystems for insects, birds and small animals. We need to think about ways of making room for bison to return and to do their magic. That magic recently came to the Métis Nation in Saskatchewan. 25 female bison transferred from Grasslands National Park to Batoche. It really is symbolic that the bison are back on our land where, you know, people fought and died for Métis rights. Michelle LeClaire says the goal is to grow the herd to 150 bison for food, education and land revitalization to ensure that we have a healthy environment for everyone. 
Back in Manitoba, this First Nation is cancelling agricultural leases of its land, turning it back into grasslands and then over to the bison, preserving the land and the living things that rely on it. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation, Manitoba. Now it's time to break down the stories shaping our world. Efforts to coax Hamas and Israel toward another deal on humanitarian aid and the release of hostages continue. And those talks again involve Qatar. Earlier in this war, Thomas Degla showed us how the tiny Gulf state hosts Hamas's leadership, an arrangement controversial and some say useful. Somewhere amid the pristine streets and all the skyscrapers, Doha has an open secret. Qatar's capital city, 1,800 kilometers away from Gaza, a comfortable home for the leadership of Hamas. That's the group's political chief, Ismail Haniya, personally labeled by the U.S. a specially designated global terrorist. But living in Qatar, he greets allies like the Iranian foreign minister in full view of the cameras. For years, he and other senior Hamas leaders have been holed up in Doha, and now more than ever, that deal has come into question. In Qatar, Hamas's political leadership is closely scrutinized and closely watched. The fact that they are harboring the bin Ladens of this story is unacceptable. Since the October 7th massacre, Qatar has positioned itself as an intermediary, helping to free Israeli hostages. But this story starts much earlier. In 2012, the Hamas leader, Hania, and Qatar's then ruler stood hand in hand. The group, already designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. and Canada, was welcomed and set up its political office in Doha. Has there been a, a benefit to having Hamas's political office sort of out in the open right there in Doha? I think right now you'd have to say it definitely is a benefit. Um, it's a controversial benefit. Uh, it's definitely one that has uh, raised some eyebrows and some anger. The tiny state, mega wealthy from natural gas, plays an outsized diplomatic role with the West. Designated a major non-NATO ally by the U.S. In September, Qatar helped secure the release of American hostages from Iran and earlier hosted negotiations between the Trump administration and the Taliban. Kristen Dewan is a scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Given that they're kind of insecure about their position, a lot of times they've tried to build relations with a number of different parties all across the region. And they've also seen it as very helpful to be able to play this mediating role. Um, throughout all this time, it's important to say that they've always maintained their very close ties with the United States. But plenty changed when Hamas militants stormed into Israel and took 1,200 lives. Within days, the U.S. Secretary of State was meeting with the Qatari Prime Minister, and Antony Blinken made this pointed public comment. There can be no more business as usual with Hamas. Murdering babies, burning families to death, taking little children as hostages, these are unconscionable acts. Then, at the United Nations, Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, berated the Qataris, demanding diplomats pile pressure on the Gulf autocracy. Qatar, which finance and arbor of Hamas leaders, could influence and enable the immediate and unconditional release of all, of all hostages. But it's complicated. Israel has mixed feelings about Doha. The prime minister's national security advisor posted on social media, Qatar's diplomatic efforts are crucial at this time. And Qatar's prime minister insists hosting Hamas has proven useful. As long as we are keeping the communication open right now and focusing on putting an end for this conflict and this is useful, that's, that will remain our main focus. Indeed, Doha helped broker talks that led to two hostages being freed at first, then another two and ultimately dozens more in exchange for Palestinians detained in Israeli-run prisons. Qatar purportedly exerts influence over Hamas by helping to fund the civil service in Gaza. 
This is not new. We found a transcript from 2014 when U.S. Congress called Qatar perhaps the largest financial patron of Hamas. Which leads us back to this. The way the Qataris pull this off is by whitewashing their role in supporting Islamic extremism by supporting businesses and investing vast sums of hydrocarbon wealth across places in London and the United States and elsewhere. Mark Wallace served as a U.S. envoy to the United Nations under George W. Bush. He now leads the nonprofit Counter Extremism Project. They're demanding a boycott of Qatar's luxury properties abroad, like London's famous Ritz Hotel sold in 2020 for more than a billion dollars to the brother-in-law of Qatar's ruler. What are the chances they are not going to be financially and, uh, and uh, personally and as a government liable in part, in part for these terror attacks? The perpetrators of these acts are hiding in plain sight, not even hiding, hosted in plain sight in luxury. Doha has now reportedly agreed to review its relationship with Hamas after the hostage situation is resolved. But some have concerns, like Professor Mehran Kamrava at Georgetown University, Qatar. We reached him in Doha. One question to ask is whether the United States wants an ally like Qatar to be hosting Hamas, or does it want a country like Iran, Syria, or even Hezbollah to be hosting Hamas? In that situation, what would that mean for the U.S. and the West? I think it means a further radicalization of, um, of Hamas and an inability to keep tabs on them. Hamas isn't leaving yet, with senior leaders comfortable a world away from Gaza, under global scrutiny more than before. Despite that scrutiny, Qatar continues to act as a critical go-between for Israel, the West, and Hamas. The country's leader getting a phone call today from U.S. President Joe Biden. According to the White House, they discussed aid for Gaza and the release of Hamas's hostages. Coming up, a change of pace. A California millionaire using his deep pockets to try and turn back time. My heart is 37, my diaphragm is 18, my left ear is 64. Somewhere in his extreme regime, there may be some anti-aging tips for the rest of us. Breaking down the battle to live long and stay young, that's just ahead. Tonight, we're breaking down the leading edge in the fight against aging. 46-year-old Brian Johnson is spending $2 million a year to be 18 again. And he says he's making progress. Ioana Romeliotis met up with Johnson earlier this year and also with researchers making their own gains. Here's Ioana once again to break down the battle to keep people young. It's a new era in aging where the fountain of youth is less of a fantasy and more a promising reality. Mice are getting younger in labs. New drugs seem to stop the clock. The future seems ageless. But here in California, Brian Johnson is out to prove that future is already here, and he's it. If you imagine how we're going to live in 20 years from now, that's what I'm doing today. Buckle up, because what the 46-year-old tech tycoon is doing is out there. Johnson is spending $2 million a year to be 18 again. That includes blood transfusions from his teenage son and being hungry all the time. And nope, it's not crazy, he says. Quite the opposite. And so in this moment in 2023, what is the genius move for the human race? What is a thing we can't see? And in my estimation, it's something just so, it's like dead simple right in front of our face. Choose existence. Existence, as far as he's concerned, there's no real end to it. Johnson gave us a tour of his modernist home equipped with a state-of-the-art clinic. So this is a blueprint clinic. It changes all the time. Like you put this on your arm and like stamp it out. It tells the genes to behave uh, in a more youthful state. This is where a team of 30 experts are conducting his one-man experiment. Johnson calls it a blueprint for the rest of us. A blueprint is an open scientific question of where are we with the fountain of youth. And to do that, I've become the most measured person in human history. 
and we use all this data about my body, we look at all the scientific evidence, we design a protocol to say we want to maximally slow my speed of aging and reverse aging damage. And then we share everything with everyone. 1.8, so even better than last time. And he is a sharer, especially online. It's uh, 5.30 right now. He wakes up at 5.30 a.m. after going to bed at 8.30. So, you know, this is just a very small demonstration. That Check out his on. pantry, not a cookie in sight. And I would take these roughly 64 pills. That's for just for the morning? That's just the morning. Johnson takes a ton of supplements, eats mostly grains and vegetables, and his last meal is before noon. Keeping your leg straight. He powers through daily exercises. Yeah, just don't look at the red light directly. And does a lot of skin treatments. None of it looks like fun, but he says he's never felt better, and he is proving age is just a number, or in his case, a bunch of them. Where are you at with your age, your biological age? My heart is 37, my diaphragm is 18, my left ear is 64. So some of my biological ages are in great shape, some are not. We're not in a situation where we've reversed my biological age by decades. But if you're looking at my DNA methylation patterns, which you cannot see the naked eye, that's telling you that I'm aging slower than the average 10 year old. What does that mean in terms of lifespan or health span? Okay, let's just say science allows me to age slower so that I get September, October, November, December for free. And so the key thing is, you want to slow your speed of aging because as we move into the future, you could probably do better and better and better and better until we get to the point where one year of time passes and I stay the same age. Okay, I think that's great, thank you. Okay, we have to admit, our heads were spinning a little after the interview, but we wondered, what can Johnson's extreme experiment and his data teach the rest of us who, like us, still enjoy the occasional burger? We took that question to Dr. Leroy Hood, who lives in Seattle. Hood is pushing 85, but his biological age is 70, thanks in part to 200 push-ups and 100 sit-ups daily. The vigorous exercise keeps the renowned biologist young in mind and body. And that's good, because Hood says he's still got a lot of work to do. How do you feel knowing that you've taken that many years off your chronological age? You know, I'm delighted, because I have a big project ahead of me that's going to take 15 to 20 years, so I'm going to be around to see the end of it. This gives you that idea. Oh, wow. That project is also about using data to transform health. What do you think? Okay. So, I mean, what don't you think? <laughs> Hood takes supplements, too. It's part of a customized wellness plan based on his genetic risk profile and he wants to design a healthcare system that does that for everyone. So really you're looking for signals or warning signs before they become too difficult to treat. That is exactly right and we're utterly confident for most chronic diseases we'll be able to find those signals. So when you look at the future, where do you see chronic disease or cancer, or Alzheimer's, do you see them gone? When I look at the future, I see most chronic diseases absolutely gone. It's extraordinary. Hood's vision is all about keeping people healthy until they die of very old age. To do it, he needs a lot of data so he can build on the research he and his colleagues have already done. So these are cold rooms and tissue culture rooms and some things like that. In the last five years, Hood and his team have tracked the medical information of nearly 5,000 people. Using genetic and other high-tech diagnostics, they helped boost their health and minimize their risk of future disease by making data-driven, personalized adjustments to their diets and other lifestyle factors. In one case, Hood and his team found a warning signal that prompted a woman to push her doctors for a colonoscopy. Just as they started the colonoscopy, they ran into an enormous colon cancer. And the next day, she was in surgery and had it out just before it metastasized. You know, data-driven health there said, gee, there's this signal that is, something's really wrong, you've got to find out what it is. Hood's studies have found nearly 200 signals of early disease, and he wants to find tens of thousands more. It's why he now wants to collect health data on one million people and use machine learning or AI to sift through it all. Hood says that means we could all have personalized guidelines for healthier living in the near future. What it will give each of us is the ability for our health span 
the number of years we live healthy to equal our lifespan, which is the number of years we live. And the second thing it'll do is give most of us a guarantee we'll live with health spans out into the 90s or even into the hundreds. So you don't think it's a fantasy to imagine living to be 100 in good health? Not at all. And I only have 15 years to go, so we'll see. <laughs> in Hood's world, people could share their information on their phones. There are caveats. The data has to be protected. And more than anything, people have to be willing to share it. And that's what worries researchers at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, who question how representative any huge health data pool would actually be because they haven't been able to pull it off. Just put it over top of your nose like we've got something The else. team here is tracking 50,000 Canadians for 20 years for one of the world's most comprehensive studies on aging. Most of the participants are Caucasian, and that's typical of most health research. So we'd collect lots of clinical data, social data, psychological data. And they Parminder Reina is running the study. He says recruiting racialized communities is tough. He thinks AI-driven, personalized health care has incredible potential, but not if diversity is missing. Who's at risk of being left out? I think that's a very important question that we have to address as a society. We have indigenous populations in this country on whom we don't have a lot of data. Our immigration patterns are changing rapidly. And if those people don't participate in research, if we don't have good data on those individuals, our AI models are not going to be able to address the needs of those populations. Back in Venice Beach, the millionaire we came to meet isn't exactly hanging with the locals. He knows he's not the everyman, but Johnson says everyone can still learn something from his data. So how accessible is it though? Because what you're doing is pretty extreme. Yeah, I know what I'm doing is extreme and it's not accessible for most people. What I hope to achieve is with my data to be the evidence to say it's worth it. So for someone to look at me and say, you know what? I believe the data and I believe it is worth my time and attention to go after this. Even if I can't do all of it, I believe that the science is there to significantly extend our lifespans and, and be much more healthy. Do you want to live forever? Yeah. I want to have the option every day to live tomorrow. Ioana tells us that Lee Hood, the renowned biologist in her story, is still doing 200 push-ups and 100 sit-ups daily at age 85. His latest research focuses on pregnant women and their immune systems and people with type 2 diabetes. In both studies, Hood's team is looking for markers or transitions where disease can occur with the goal of intervening before disease develops. Coming up, another one of our favorite moments of the year. A fuzzy burglar takes a BC gas bar owner by surprise. I looked up at the cameras and saw Buddy standing there in the doorway. A crooked bear pockets a pack of gummy bears, then takes off. That's next. As 2023 comes to an end, we're counting down our 12 most loved moments of the year. Tonight, at number six, a furry bandit with a taste for sweets, but only in moderation. How often do you see a bear go shopping? I was just sitting at the desk doing uh, some papers and drinking coffee. I heard a sound. I looked up at the cameras and saw Buddy standing there in the doorway. He just sauntered his way around until he got to the gummy bear. He walked by meat products, bait, ice cream, chocolate, chips. He walked past it all. He gently picks that one bag out of a box of about 20, 25 and goes on his way. I grabbed my pack of smokes, went outside and had a smoke and watched him eat the damn stuff. That's so cheeky he was. I went across the parking lot and uh, laid down and ate it. <laughs> and I was standing there watching him having a cigarette going, you're pretty cocky. <laughs> we have a really big problem with bears in the community. You've got to try and keep yourself as safe as possible, but at the same time, keep your eyes open. What can I say? He was a very respectful consumer, except he stole. <laughs> 
I just can't get over the bear took just one bag of gummies with all those other treats at the store, valued at 70 cents, we're told, and then, you know, waited till he got outside to enjoy it. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Renee Filipponi. Take care.